What's up everybody and welcome to another episode of China Update. My name is Tony, it's great to see you guys again. For anyone who's joining me for the first time, I'm a lawyer by trade, but I'm currently in an executive role in China. I'm, trade in, I'm trained in Chinese foreign policy and economics, and part of my job deals with having to follow the big macro developments coming out of the Middle Kingdom, China. And uh, basically on a Friday night, I'd sit down with some of my mates and uh, talk to them about what had happened that week. And they said, man, this stuff's really interesting, maybe you should throw it up on YouTube. So. This is basically what I'm doing here. I'm gonna talk about some of the big stories that I think you should really know about China, so you're basically on top of what's going on here. I hope you enjoyed. If this is the sort of thing you can get behind or that you're interested in, uh, maybe consider subscribing. I release one of these every week, so uh, it won't blow up your mailbox. If you appreciate what I'm doing here, if you dig what we're doing here, please smash that like button. It is a massive help for anyone who's just starting up with a YouTube channel. So, it's a little bit cold, I'm a little bit hungry, Let's look at this week's uh, China update. Okay, so let's start by talking about the China-US relationship around the trade deal. Uh, as you know from last week, uh, the American side and the Chinese side said that they were able to finally agree on a final version in principle for the so-called phase one trade agreement. At this point, it's worth pointing out two main things. One, we do not have the exact details yet. We only have what both sides have publicized, but there is no official English or official Chinese version. I'm, I'm very interested in reading that Chinese version and, and seeing how, how the wording is put. And two, it hasn't been signed yet, uh, which isn't a big deal. There's there's uh, potential for Xi Jinping and Trump uh, to sign them themselves at some sort of meeting early next year, or they can do what the US side did with the Japanese trade agreement from a few months ago and then just get top officials to sign it in, in uh, in a fixed location. It doesn't necessarily have to be signed by the head of state. What is also very important at this point is the Chinese reaction in terms of its media statements to its own citizens. So what I mean by that is the weekend immediately following the deal being announced, which you'll remember it was a Thursday or a Friday, depending on where in the world you were, there was no mention of it in China on major state broadcasts. I was also reading every major uh, trade related story the following week all of this week in Chinese and every time there was a story about a development that was directly tied to implementation policy implementation because of the tr phase one trade agreement the report was very short and to the point and had no commentary which is very interesting because up until this point there has been a plethora of commentary. Also, just this week, the Ministry of Commerce had a policy setting meeting, basically where they talk about all the policy that they need to roll out from the central government level in 2020. They discussed everything in minute detail, including things like developing more pedestrian areas in major uh, commercial centers around the country and introducing more appliances like kitchen and other appliances in rural areas but it didn't discuss the trade deal or its implementation at all. Now, the reason why I believe there's been limited commentary on the Chinese side about the trade deal is because the Chinese gave up more than the Americans. And to be honest, the Chinese gave up more than they said they would be willing to give up in the lead up to the signing. I mean, after all, the bottom line, as it was communicated in official commentary, was that the Chinese side would only enter this agreement if the Americans uh, cancel all future agreements and roll back all tariffs to pre-trade war levels. Our understanding of the agreement is future tariffs have been cancelled, like the planned tariffs on uh, December the fifteenth. They never went. They never went through. Um, but the reduction in tariffs, it seems, is just on one block of tariffs, and that's a reduction of one half, fifty percent, from fifteen percent to seven point. Um, 5%. So that bottom line was not met. Now the fact that it's likely that the Chinese gave more concessions than the Americans is not surprising when we consider two main things. One, the trade war was hurting the Chinese side a lot more than the American side. We know from the data that was released last week that the deficit between the countries has been reduced. We know that year on year uh, exports, Chinese exports to the United States was down substantially. The US had suffered an almost a, a, a small, small reduction in their exports, something like one or two percent year on year in October. So the Chinese side was hurting a lot more. And two, the Chinese side need a deal more than the Americans. Now, don't get me wrong, both sides wanted a deal. And when I say the American side here, I mean the White House. There, there are reasons why the White House wanted to get a deal across the line. The Chinese wanted it for their own reasons, but the Chinese needed it slightly more. Uh, so this is probably why 
you've seen more concessions on the Chinese side. But like I said before, we have not really, we have not seen the final trade agreement based on what has been announced by both sides. This is what we can conclude. For anyone who didn't watch last week's episode, let's quickly discuss what both sides agreed to to get this agreement over the line. The Chinese basically agreed to three extra things. One, they're going to buy 200 billion more US goods over the next two years, 50 billion of which is gonna be agricultural purchases, which was required by uh, Trump himself. Two, they're going to implement greater IP protections for American firms operating in China. And three, they're going to liberalize the financial sector somewhat to allow more American investment and greater American involvement in their financial assets within China itself. So you've got two potentially structural changes and an agreement to buy more to in an effort to reduce the deficit between the two countries. In exchange, the Americans agreed to one, not implement any new tariffs and two, see a slight reduction in tariffs that are already in place. And like I said, that's going to be a reduction from 15% to 7.5% on a block of tariffs. Not all of their tariffs, just a block of their tariffs. The big question for me is where is this $200 billion going to come from? What exactly is China going to buy here? China wasn't buying $200 billion. They're barely buying $200 200 billion before the trade war. So what are they going to buy? I mean, there's going to be demand for agricultural products um, like pork and, 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 and protein-based meats. They need this because they have protein shortages at the moment. But demand for soy, for example, is down. What exactly can the Americans provide uh, for the Chinese to buy? I mean, the American side have said that they're going to buy energy and agricultural products and manufacturing. But I think if they do try and reach these numbers, you're going to see a big part of that is going to be in services and it's probably going to be financial services. To be honest with me, I'm very, very pessimistic about this. I think that this agreement is on very, very sh shaky foundations. In fact, I said this when it was first announced a few months ago and then it quickly collapsed a few weeks later. I think best case scenario, this trade deal is going to be implemented and there's never ever going to be a phase two. The more difficult structural aspects of the relationship are not going to be agreed to. And this is basically going to be the new normal going forward. That's best case scenario. But what could also happen is that the entire thing collapses in a couple of months. The overall relationship between the two countries is still in a downward trajectory. I think that the, the relationship is going to be increasingly advers adversarial. And to be quite frank, even if the White House is very, very happy having a trade agreement with the Chinese side, there is still the matter of Congress. And Congress is bipartisan in its anger at China at the moment. And you can see that with the, the laws I've already passed, which we've discussed on previous episodes. And to be frank, there's going to be more laws to come. We've already seen laws about Xinjiang and laws for, regarding Hong Kong and economic uh, sanction mechanisms in place within those, uh, those regulatory frameworks. And as of this week, the House introduced uh, a bill regarding Tibet and human rights in Tibet. So there is a massive risk that the overall relationship will deteriorate so much that it will collapse into the trade space, which up until this point has been separated from these more sensitive political issues between the two countries. It will collapse into that trade space and the trade relationship will also be pulled down with it. And any gains that have been made in the so-called Trade One Agreement will be reversed. It seems though that the big international institutions are far more optimistic than I am. After the announcement that the trade deal got across the line, the IMF announced that they're going to revisit its forecast. And then they said they were moving their 2020 forecast for China from 5.8% uh, to 6%. And Oxford Economics uh, did a similar reforecast. They said their forecast of 5.7 has now been revised to 6% for next year because of the success of this trade one agreement. So they're more optimistic than I am. As always, guys, I will keep you updated on the trade relationship and the wider US-China relationship generally, because it's a big deal. Okay, guys, on Tuesday, the People's Liberation Navy commissioned its first domestically constructed aircraft carrier. This is part of its wider policy to develop an effective global blue water navy and project naval power beyond the east and the south china sea the name of this the second in the fleet of aircraft carriers is the shandong hao named after of course shandong province which is in the east of china i hope for their sake that the performance of this aircraft carrier is better than the performance of that uh, province's local economy because they're dealing with some very serious debt related issues at the moment. So this aircraft carrier can carry 36 J-15 fighter jets along with uh, other aircraft and military helicopters but the technology is still nowhere near as developed as what the US produce, is producing on their aircraft carriers. What might be concerning for policymakers in Washington is the speed in which the Chinese are producing 
these carriers. The third carrier is currently being constructed in Shanghai, a port in Shanghai, and the fourth is in the design phases at the moment. To put that in perspective, the US has about 10 in a few years, China will be looking at having three to four with more on the way potentially. Okay, now let's have a quick update about the Hong Kong protests. To talk about Hong Kong this week, we need to talk about Xi Jinping's trip to Macau. But first, a couple of interesting little developments in the Special Administrative Region of Hong Kong. Uh, Kiri Lam last weekend uh, made a trip to uh, Beijing. This is a regular annual occurrence where the chief executive of the SAR government has to go to Beijing. It seemed like uh, Xi Jinping's administration gave her their full uh, support. So this sort of undermines the rumors a few months ago that Beijing was planning on replacing her. So either Beijing's position has changed on this or those original reports were false. The second small piece of news coming out of Hong Kong was Hong Kong police shutting down Spark Alliance, which was a crowdfunding platform which was set up to support those in the Hong Kong protesters that were arrested. So basically pay their legal fees, any protesters that might be arrested. The police shut it down and froze about 70 million uh, Hong Kong dollars, uh, which I think is about, I should have done this beforehand, I think that's about nine or 10 million USD. Um, they basically said their position was that the organizers of the website were using these assets for other investments. Like I said, the most important news this week about Hong Kong was actually happening in Macau. Chairman Xi Jinping went to Macau to celebrate the 20 year anniversary of the handover of Macau from Portugal to the People's Republic of China. Now, Macau is a special administrative region. It operates under Yi Guo Liang Zhi, or one country, two systems, just like Hong Kong does. So it has a very similar relationship with the mainland government. Macau was a colonial holding of uh, Portugal, uh, just like Hong Kong was a colonial holding of the UK. The handover was in uh, 1999, and so this is the 20 year anniversary. Now, Macau has developed very differently from Hong Kong. So this week the central government announced policy changes in Macau which would allow it to become a more active financial player and develop a financial hub. This includes signals from the central government that they are willing to open up Macau's offshore RMB uh, exchange capabilities which would threaten Hong Kong's dominance in this area. It seems that the mainland might be trying to hedge its bets so to speak with Hong Kong and allowing some of that influence to move to Macau. Chinese academics have discussed how Macau is the more well-behaved of the two special administrative regions, pointing to laws that the central government wanted to get passed. For example, a law in 2009 criminalizing subversion against the Chinese state. This was a law that failed to pass in Hong Kong in 2003 and has not been able to be passed since then, and is a law that has been called for within the mainland to be introduced in Hong Kong after the protests have entered. Now that law that was passed in 2009 was used this year by the authorities to stop protests in Macau. People applied, uh, applied to, uh, to hold protests in support of the Hong Kong protests in uh, Macau, but were not allowed to because of this law. And when they went to protest anyway, they were arrested through the application of this act. So why has Macau's story been so different to Hong Kong's? Well, Macau was much smaller at the time of the handover. It was less wealthier in per capita terms. Also, when that handover occurred, the government of Portugal offered citizenship to all residents of Macau. This was not offered, the British did not offer this to, to all Hong Kongers. They were given a special type of passport, but not full citizenship. So a lot of residents left Macau and moved to the EU to live in the EU. There's also a much larger mainland Chinese presence within Macau. Something like 50% of the population of Macau were not born in Macau. So these are all factors behind the difference in the stories of these two special administrative regions. These sort of developments are very, very important for our understanding about what the long-term strategy towards Hong Kong is for Beijing. While it is interesting to follow the day-by-day -day protests that happen on the ground, it is these wider policy changes that are happening in the mainland and the relationship between the mainland and other major players globally like the US that is going to have a direct effect on the future of Hong Kong going forward. You can already see a strategy of trying to pull away some of the power from Hong Kong in the future post protests to undermine its power and its leverage going into the future to reduce the risk of this sort of thing happening again. There are other things that are planned to happen in Hong Kong over the medium to long term. And to be honest, a lot of them are not very pretty. So a few months ago it was the NBA. 
Now it is football's turn to piss off censors in the People's Republic of China. This week, a prominent and outspoken player for Arsenal, I've written down his name because I don't know how to say it properly, Masit Ozil, Masit Oznal, criticized China for its treatments of Muslims, particularly in Xinjiang province, and received a tremendous backlash within Chinese uh, China itself. In fact, there are some reports of fans, or I should say ex-fans, burning his jersey and he has already been removed from some mobile games including Pro Evolution Soccer 2020. And on the back of that news, FC Cologne announced that it's going to pull a multi-million dollar deal with China and they said that their reasoning was uh, the human rights record within China itself. So an example of a club making a stand and putting its money where its mouth is. Now I normally don't talk about these sort of stories, individuals or companies that have run afoul with Chinese censors and the sort of scuffle between the two sides. But I think for something like this, uh, my thinking is the same with the NBA story. Football, basketball, these big sporting corporations are very, very popular. popular. They're things that people follow and that regular people around the world care about. And there are also a lot of money involved in some of these big leaves on both sides. And money talks in democracy and capitalist countries as much as it talks in socialist countries like China. And also when it comes to this sort of stuff, whether for the NBA or for football now, or whatever it might be tomorrow, the attempt to try and gag every player or every team or every manager of every team that is popular internationally is not a winning strategy. It is not very sustainable. And I don't think that is a hill that the, that the central government in China wants to fight and die on. So it will be interesting to see how this is uh, also settled between both sides uh, and compare it to the NBA story. And at the end of the day, if this is not handled well, it's not going to be very popular with people. In fact, there are already calls to boycott the um, 2022 Winter Olympics that are set to be held in Beijing or to try and change the venue. And if China cannot adequately manage its relationship with international sporting agencies, this is certainly not going to help its cause. Now, another story this week about the state's efforts to try and increase their role in academic governance. There were some small protests that were shut down in Fudan University this week. Now, Fudan is probably, depending on how you count, the third or the fourth most prestigious university in China. It's in Shanghai, which is a very developed and cosmopolitan city by, by Chinese standards, at least. Now, these protests were in response to the announcement that the university had decided to take freedom of thought and academic independence out of their charter and replace it with obedience to the party or support of the governance of the Communist Party. Now, in addition to the protests that happened on campus, there were also trending hashtags on Weibo, a microblogging site within China itself, highly critical of the decision to take that language out of the charter of what is a prestigious and relatively open university by Chinese standards. And these, uh, these discussions were later censored uh, and these hashtags were taken down. Now, this year itself is a particularly sensitive year for universities. Places like Peking University, for example, have had uh, increased uh, security and greater scrutiny on discourse within the campus itself. Peking University, most people would agree, is the top uh, university in the country. It's certainly the most liberal university in the country. This year has seen very sensitive anniversaries, including from 89. And there is a Chinese tradition of protest movements beginning with intellectual circles and starting on university campuses. So this year, there was heightened security and heightened scrutiny. But what is happening in Fudan University is actually part of a wider movement that has been happening at lower tier cities with less prestigious universities for a couple of years now. And the reason why these developments have been concerning to so many people is it seems like this is a return of the party's control into areas of social life and uh, society that they had retreated from in the 90s and the early 2000s under the current administration. And finally, we need to talk about the housing market and the housing bubble that is occurring within China at the moment and the concern and, quite frankly, potential crisis it poses to economic policymakers in Beijing. You'll remember that in the last episode, I discussed that major work conference that was concluded last week. And one of the main uh, things that came out of the conference was a concern for housing speculation. This week, uh, the vice, the top ranked vice premier and a member of the Politburo Standing Committee, Han Zheng, reiterated this point at a series of meetings where he said housing is for living, not for speculation. 
We have not seen this level of focus on the issue of housing speculation for a very, very long time. It has really come out this year and it's shown that the central government is increasingly concerned about housing speculation and the systemic risk it can cause to the financial system of China itself. There was a report this week that looks into the cost of housing in the 40 biggest cities in the country. They found that 21 of the 40 cities saw a drop in value. This is the worst performance in about four years years. You'll also remember from last week that there was a report then from a uh, institute and a policy think tank in Beijing that said that based on its research, which was quite comprehensive, 66% of new home loans, new housing loans, were given to households to buy a second or third house, which would suggest that the market is currently being fueled by housing speculation. Household debt in China is now at very concerning levels. The country that used to be known as a nation of savers now have household disposable debt, sorry, now have household debt to disposable income ratios higher than the United States and growing at a much faster rate. And this growth in household debt is being driven by one thing, and that is the housing market. Okay, guys, that is our China update for this week. Thank you so much for watching. For everyone watching at home, have a Merry Christmas, and I'll see you just before the new year next week. See you next time.